Hello, everybody. I'm just waiting to get started. I see two eyeballs. Hello, everyone. As everyone is going to be popping on here in the next couple of minutes, I will just riff for a little bit. Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Wooten, and I am here for my monthly Facebook Live to answer your questions. Whatever it is you want to ask me, you can ask me. All you have to do is pop it in the chat section, and I will answer those questions. So... While we are waiting for all of our friends to pop on from all over the world, I want to tell you, hi, I'm so glad you're here. I'm Sarah. I am a veterinarian. Hi. So go ahead and pop into the chat and tell me hi. Tell me where you're from. Tell me how much you love cats. Tell me the name of your cat. And when you have questions for me, I can answer pretty much all the questions that you might have. I practiced small animal medicine. Hi. Oh, I already have good questions up here already. So I will, I'll get to those questions in one second. I practiced veterinary medicine in the States, United States of America for 16 years, graduated from UC Davis. So I've had a bit of experience with these animals and I'm here today to share my knowledge with you. So I want to tell you before we get into this, my disclaimer that I always have to put up. This is no different than any, any other time. But this, everything I'm saying here is for educational purposes only, because I do not have an actual legal agreement with you as your pet's veterinarian. It's called a veterinarian client relationship. I cannot actually give you any actual advice but I can give you educational advice that you can use. Everything I say here is not ever, ever, ever intended to replace the valuable service that your local veterinarian provides you. So take what I'm saying and utilize it how you may. But remember, this is not a substitute for veterinary advice. So, okay. Hi, 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 hi. Hi, ice cream cake. Hi, that of a rose. Hi, Ramon. Hi. Oh, you are from Southern California and your cat's name is Chewy because you got him on Star Wars Day. May the fourth be with you, my friend. All right. We have Angel from Two Cats, Bradley and Kahlo. Beautiful. Um, yes. Okay. So uh, questions, 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 questions. Let's go for this first one. Okay. Uh, is pretty litter a scam or are they worth it? And is it safe for cats? What is this stuff? Pretty litter. Pretty litter uh, for cats. Let's see what we got. I have not used this product yet. Okay. So pretty litter cat litter is a litter box subscription. Uh, and they offer health monitoring with the color changes of litter. Well, this is awesome. So Pretty Litter basically has color changes to tell you when your cat has a potential health in issue. And so it probably can, so it can check um, the alkalinity, which is the acid base status of the urine. And we know that urine needs to stay within a narrow pH. Um, otherwise, if it gets too far out, then it can potentiate urinary tract infections. We have um, acidity. Ooh. Um, so basically, this litter can tell uh, the difference in pH of urine, and it can tell whether there is blood in the urine. 
So uh, this could be a actual helpful thing. Um, trying to see if it's what it is made from. So it looks like it's just a, it doesn't, I'm not sure if it's a clumping litter or not, but this is a pretty cool thing. So if you have issues with your cat's urinary tract health, you may wanna look into this product uh, because it can um, basically let you know, it allows you a way to monitor your cat's um, health in their urine. It probably does not work very well in multi, actually it, it it probably is a little bit confusing in multi-cat households if you have multiple cats using the same litter box. So it, it may not be as uh, helpful for somebody in that situation, but if you have a single cat, uh, this could be a pretty awesome product for you. So yeah, um, it's made out of silica gel which is a little bit different. So I, you know, what I would do, um, I would, and it says it's even okay that there is a lack of dust in this kind of litter as well, which is nice. But you do need to be uh, careful if your cat does like to eat litter. Um, so that would be my recommendations on that. I would say try a sample of it and see if it actually works for you. Uh, I'm definitely not endorsing it one way or the other, but I think it's an interesting concept and could be another way for you to monitor your cat's health at home. All right, let's go down and look and see who, hello everybody else. I just wanted to say hi to all our new viewers. My name is Dr. Sarah Wooten. I am here to answer your questions, all things cats. This is for educational purposes only. It's not intended to replace the services of your local veterinarian, but here is what I have to say about this. Hi, hi Caitlin, how are you? My cat's 11 months old. I'm not sure if she's lost her baby teeth. Should I be worried? Well, that is an excellent question, my friend. So if you guys know anything about cats, you know that they have two sets of teeth. They have one set of kitten teeth, and then they have a second set of adult teeth, right? And most cats will lose all of their baby teeth uh, in between six to eight months of age. Sometimes it goes a little bit longer. Sometimes it starts a little bit sooner. And what happens is they lose these baby teeth because the teeth the roots start to resorb. And so the teeth just naturally fall out. Now, sometimes we do have baby teeth that do, does not want to fall out, right? So in those cases, what you'll see is typically you'll see the adult tooth growing in underneath the baby tooth. The baby tooth, one of the main ones is the canines here, right? And in your cat, I wish I had a skull here, but in your cat, those are the big pointy teeth in the front. And every once in a while in both cats and dogs, that ba those baby teeth don't for some reason fall out. And so what you'll see is you'll see a double level, two levels of uh, baby te of teeth, the baby teeth and then the adult teeth coming underneath. So the question is, is it a problem? Uh, if it is, if it doesn't ever fall out, my friend, Caitlin, then yes, you'll need to get those baby teeth extracted. Uh, your cat is pretty young, so I would say I would give it a couple more months and see what would happen if this was my patient. I wouldn't send you to surgery tomorrow, but I would say, hey, you need to um, you need to be checking those teeth every day. Sometimes it's a little harder with cats than with dogs, but cats can get used to it as well. If you stick your fingers in there and kind of wiggle on the teeth a little bit, just slight pressure, nothing hard, nothing crazy. Sometimes that can uh, get them to start to loosen up as well. If those teeth have are still present and the cat is a year and a half old at this point, go ahead and schedule to have them removed. It's typically a very quick procedure. It may not even require full general anesthesia. You can just ask for sedation um, in, in a lot of cases, which can save you some money and uh, that's always nice, right? But if, the, if they haven't fallen out in the next couple of months, get them out, all right? That's the question that I have. So here we go. Do you have a suggestion for an actual working flea treatment? Well, my friend, that is a complicated question, right? Because when it comes to fleas and we are still, many of us, I mean, you guys are from all around the world. So thank you for tuning in. I'm so happy you're here. 
So here in North America, summer is windy, is going to be windy down in the next month or two. And uh, a lot of the areas, the fleas are going to become more dormant. A lot of areas in the United States and around the world, it's flea season year round, right? Any place where it's hot year round, you got fleas year round. And fleas are a problem. Um, they're, they're challenging to control because you not only need to kill the adult flea that you see, right? That's, that's what we see as the human we see the adult flea, but then you have to get rid of all the flea life stages that are in the environment. And typically, if you see one flea, that means that you have a lot of life stages in the environment. And when I talk about life stages, the flea is uh, has several life stages. It's an egg, then it's a pupa, then it's a larva, then it's an adult, right? And it's the adult that is feeding on our pets. And so you got to kill the adults, right? But you also got to get rid of all the other stages in your environment. So long story short, yes, there are several products available on the market today that work very well. Uh, I am not sure what is available in your area, but talk to your veterinarian because typically those newer products are only available through a veterinarian or you need, just need a veterinarian prescription for them because you can buy a lot of them online. And I'm not going to do any specific recommendations because products, even the same product, here's the crazy thing, guys, even the same product in the United States has one name here and then another name someplace else because of, you know, labeling requirements or government requirements or whatever. But I am going to say that it's really important that you talk to your veterinarian about a good product that will actually kill adult fleas. And you need something that's long lasting. Most of these products last 30 days or longer. And you need something that kills them pretty quick and keeps killing them, right? Because the longer a, so a, a flea can generate eggs in a matter of days, right? And then they, they spread those eggs everywhere. And now instead of one flea, you've got a hundred fleas, right? And then all of those fleas are going to re reproduce as well. So make sure you have something that is quick killing, long lasting and kills for a long time, right? Then you need to make sure that you're addressing your environment. So one common thing that I used to see in practice all the time is I would see an animal, animal would be covered in fleas. And I would give the, uh, I would give the client the product and say, put this on your, your pet every three weeks for the entire year. And that should take care of your problem. And sometimes these people would come back a month later and they would be mad, right? Doctor, this stuff doesn't work. I'm still seeing fleas. In fact, I'm seeing more fleas than I saw before. What the heck? And so then I would have to go into this really long spiel about how, what I just told you guys, how the fleas are not only on the pets, but they are in the environment, right? And when I say in the environment, they love to hide in carpets, carpets, cracks, crevices, couch cushions, bedding, uh, anywhere your pet hangs out in the house, right? That's where those immature life stages are going to be hanging out. They love under couch cushions. They love under seat cushions, right? Um, so what I would tell this person a month later, okay, you put the product on, you're killing all the adult fleas. Good job. The problem is you have a whole host of fleas that are hanging out in the environment, different life stage that are willing to grow up and feast on your animal. And the problem is, is that the uh, adult killing products, as good as they are, which I do recommend them, they don't get the other life stages. So you need to not, own, I mean, it's three pronged here. You need something to kill the adults. I also recommend a insect growth regulator. Big words, I know. Um, Lufenuron is the uh, usually the product that, that I go to, the ingredient that I go to. And it's in a product called Interceptor. And what that does is that makes fleas sterile. So they cannot reproduce, right? So you've got, you're killing the adults. You're making them sterile, really important. And then you also have to treat the environment. Okay, so I'm giving you a three-prong answer here because that's truly how it is. I wish there was a magic bullet. Oh, I wish there was, but there just isn't. So treating your environment. So you've got to vacuum you have to vacuum. You have to vacuum a lot, like every couple of days, because those fleas are just going to keep hatching, right? Anything that's in your environment is going to keep hatching. And so you want to vacuum everything. 
You want to vacuum under your couch cushions. You want to wash bedding at least once a week. And I would say all the pets bedding, um, if they sleep in your bed with you, you wash your bedding as well, because that's where it all hides. I know this is gross. I know. So, and I would do that for a month, at least, at least maybe six, six weeks, right? And then you also have to make sure they're not getting reinfested from the environment. So what is your yard like? Fleas love cool areas where there's a lot of leaf litter or tall grass or cool grass or shade. So pick up the leaves, keep the grass trim short. Um, if there are any wildlife dens nearby, either keep your animal out of them. And I'm just thinking of places where, you know, an, a, a wild animal would come by, even a squirrel and rest, right? So, um, and then you can also use products in your environment um, that can reduce fleas as well. There's all kinds of bug bombs, make sure they're pet safe. One of the products that I've been hearing about a lot that people tend to like that's a natural product is called um, Wonderside. So I haven't used it yet, but maybe check it out, Wonderside. And then there's diatomace diatomaceous earth. I don't recommend rubbing it on cats. I just don't. But it's a fantastic natural way to control fleas in the environment. And you can um, you can rub it into carpets. You can um, sprinkle it into corners and cracks and crevices around your house. And the way that it works is it dries out uh, flea larva and flea pupa uh, and kills them before they get to an adult stage. All right, I've talked about this for a while. If you wanna learn more about how to control fleas, I would check out Dr. Dryden, D-R-Y-D-E-N. His website, he may be under Dr. Flea as well, but he's one of the leading experts in flea research. He talks about things like this, and he talks about something called a red line home, which is when you start treating the fleas, they get worse before they get better. And it can be really frustrating if you don't have the knowledge and guidance, but that website can give you tons more information on this particular vexing problem. So, okay, here we go. Do, 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 do. Kim. Hi, Kim. My cat is always licking things and getting into plastic, dot, dot, dot. This must be a problem. So I would say that your cat has a little bit of a fetish. Um, and we're not here to judge. We're not here to judge this cat or anybody. But uh, cats, just like dogs, do like to explore their environment with their mouths. And if your cat has a particular penchant for a plastic texture, then you're going to want to be extra vigilant around your house to pick up anything that your cat could chew on and swallow. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, just small plastic things, right? Um, and cats can be very smart animals, but they can also make bad decisions and swallow things they shouldn't. And so I have taken a lot of plastic plastic toys and other types of uh, products out of animals surgically that, especially hair, hair ties. I don't know what it is about cats and hair ties, but man, they just love those things. Maybe, maybe it smells like their owner. I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I have taken a lot of hair ties out of cats. So you're going to just need to watch your cat and kind of pick up all that stuff that um, the cat is getting into uh, and then try and redirect your cat onto safer substances or textures such as cat toys, cat trees, things like that. Um, but you know, some of it is just preference. So I would say make sure to cat proof your home of plastic. Okay. Okay, here's a, here is a question from Ice Cream Cake. <laughs> Hi friend. Uh, my cat's name is Lily Sharon Rose. Yes, it is. Beautiful name. She is so finicky with food. It's frustrating. I feel guilty. Any tricks? Uh, she licks gravy and does not eat as much. So big question, right? And in fact, I am putting out a video pretty soon on 10 reasons, the top 10 reasons why cats won't eat, right? Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why cats won't eat. Um, it can it can stem from a strong food preference to an actual illness, right? So first thing, ice cream cake, do not feel guilty. That is the, that is guilt is a man-made construct and it does not serve us anymore. And you're just torturing yourself, right? You are punishing yourself for your cat's behavior. 
clearly your intention is good. Clearly you are trying. So take that guilt and just toss it out the window. Okay. Because it's not helping. Right. So what I would say is there's a lot of factors. I would say if you haven't talked to a veterinarian yet, talk to a veterinarian. Um, if your cat hasn't been seen for a while, have your cat seen because there's a lot of things that can make them not want to eat and they can range from very mild to more serious. And so you want to make sure that there isn't a medical cause for it. If there is no medical cause, like you've had the cat checked, you've had some blood work run, everything looks great. Then your veterinarian can, uh, help you with, um, any other recommendations. So a couple things from me when I see cats that are finicky. So, um, it's important to make sure that she's eating enough calories every day. And the reason for that is if cats do not eat enough, they can develop fatty liver syndrome, which is a potentially fatal condition. Cats are weird, right? Like dogs can go weeks without eating. Humans can go weeks without eating. Cats can go maybe a week, maybe, and then they get sick and they're designed to eat every, something, at least something every day. So you do want to make, it's very important that your cat is eating and it's really good that you are noticing. So a couple of things. Um, does your cat have any dental disease? Is there something in the mouth that hurts? Does your cat like canned food more than dry food? Um, does your cat like certain textures? Does your cat like certain shapes? Some cats are very specific. They only like triangles. They don't like stars, right? Um, is your cat being bullied by other cats or is your cat anxious? Because even anxiety can lead to a loss of appetite. Do you see where, where I'm getting here? I sitting in my little place in Colorado, cannot tell you why your cat is eating, why your cat isn't eating. And I can't say, hey, get that cat checked out, make sure there's not something else going on. If you've just got a picky cat, right? So you got to get the calories in the cat, right? So a couple things, try warming the food up. If it's canned food, uh, warm it up in the microwave for like 10 seconds. Cats don't, um, they're, they, they don't smell quite as well. And so sometimes they need a little bit of additional aroma to get them going, but not too hot, like 10, 15 seconds. Um, sometimes you can add some broth, uh, chicken broth to it, to something to make it seem a bit more appetizing. If your cat um, is, make sure your cat isn't feeling stressed. Make sure the food bowl and everything is in a nice, calm place, right? And there's no other cats bullying or children <laughs> or your cat's not anxious about something else. If your cat really is just not, not wanting to eat, um, there is always rotisserie chicken. Okay. So here in the States, we have this thing called rotisserie chicken and it smells like divine and you get it from the grocery store. It's just in a bag. And I say to my clients, take the rotisserie chicken, take it home. You eat most of it. <laughs> it's for you. But take some of that chicken breast and shred some of that chicken breast onto into the food and kind of mix it all up. Sometimes that's enough to kind of stoke their appetite, right? If you're still having issues with appetite and the cat's totally healthy, but just not eating enough, there are appetite stimulants as well. You can talk to your veterinarian about getting an appetite stimulant in your cat. But the most important thing is to find out what's going on, what's going on, making sure that cat is healthy. Okay. All right. Hopefully that's going to get you enough to get started on this journey, right? I'm not going to solve the problem for you. Okay. Here's a, here's this very sweet question. Thank you so much for asking this. Why is my cat still kind of scared of me after years of adopting? Oh, because you adopted a special needs kitty who got some emotional trauma or something, right? So I don't know how, how old your cat was when they, when you adopted your cat, but remember when you adopt a cat, you adopt, just like when you adopt a human, you adopt all their baggage that they had before. So I, I don't know, it, maybe in your cat's background, there was somebody who looked like you, who, who was scary to your cat. Maybe your cat um, was just had a very scary life before. Um, some cats, they are just more prone to anxiety, right? Maybe your cat had a hard upbringing. What's really interesting uh, is that they're, they're doing a lot of research now into a condition called uh, feline interstitial cystitis. 
I know it's big doctor words. All it means is inflammation of the bladder that is emotional. It's emotionally um, charged. And we've seen it in women. Women get it, but cats get it as well. And what they're starting to research is, is you know, what kind of life did this cat have in utero? Was its mother scared? Was its mother well-fed, right? Um, or 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 not, not well-fed, right? And even a cat's in, experience in utero, they experience all the stresses and everything that their, their mother goes through. And so, the, and they can't go through talk therapy like we are. They can't like sit and examine their feelings and go, huh, maybe this is a childhood trauma. Maybe, maybe I'm dragging the past into the present and maybe I shouldn't be reacting to the, the man who feeds me with fear. No, they don't think like that. So I would say it could be any number of those things. The only thing that you can continue to do is be positive, patient, quiet. Also, you could talk to a professional about calming AIDS. Some cats just their anxiety levels too high that if you add in something that is calming to them, it can get their anxiety or their fear down low enough so that you you can start some different training or some different socialization. And calming aids, uh, they range from everything from one of my favorites is a feline a feel away pheromone spray. It is a pheromone, which is a chemical that uh, animals use to communicate with each other that mother cats release when they are nursing, right? And so it's very calming to cats and it comes in sprays and diffusers and wipes. Maybe trying something like that around your house will bring the anxiety level down enough for your cat to realize that you're not dangerous, right? Other calming aids, uh, they have a thunder shirt, which is like a weighted vest for a cat. And yes, I know some of this sounds silly, but these things are out there and you guys need to know. There is, um, there are many calming supplements on the market. Um, I would talk to your veterinarian and see what they recommend. There are actual prescription drugs that you can give that are what we call anxiolytics. They cut the anxiety, right? And they're usually just for short-term usage. Um, but, and then making sure that your cat's environment is as calm as possible, right? I mean, we all do the best we can. But hopefully that gives you some insight into what could be going on with your cat. All right, here's a question from Nora. Hello, my friend Nora. My cat stinks a lot. What should I do? Ah! <laughs> Smelly cat, smelly cat. Oh, so one of the videos that I had a couple of months ago, I was looking through your guys' comments and your comments are hilarious, by the way, I love them. But one, one person said, why am I seeing Phoebe from, from Friends? And that literally made me laugh so hard. So thank you, Nora, for asking a question about a smelly cat. Okay, so what could make your cat stink? Well, so many things. Pretty much any part of your cat can stink from the skin to the butthole, to the mouth, to the paws, to the anything, anything can stink. So you, the other thing is some cats just have odor. And so the first thing that comes to my mind is, is your cat neutered? Do you have a male cat that's not neutered? Probably not. Most people have male cats now that are neutered. But if you did, then that's the reason why your cat stinks right there. Because neutered cats have a unmistakable musk about them, my friends. If you've ever had a male cat or been around a male cat, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. The only way to deal with that is get it, get them neutered. And if they're if they're an adult, that smell might not ever go away. Just so you know. Number two, uh, dental disease. Cats are as susceptible to dental disease as any other animal, any other mammal. So if they have some problem in their mouth, could be dental disease. Three, skin infections. Skin infections can stink to high heaven. Fungal infections, and I'm thinking um, uh, the fungus that grows on the skin, right? It's not candida, but that is a very stinky, um, foot smelly kind of thing. Fungal infections on the skin. We also have ringworm, right? That can stink as well. Bacterial infections on the skin. Abscesses stink 
so bad, so bad. And that smell comes from what we call the anaerobic bacteria. It's the same thing that's in a mouth. Um, what happens is they usually get bit by another cat and then it creates an abscess by the bacteria that was in that cat's mouth being uh, injected under the skin. Then you get a local abscess. Stink. Bad. Anal glands. Anal glands can stink too. Cats have them just like dogs. So if the smell is coming from the hind end, could be that. Also, certain metabolic conditions can cause stinkiness. Um, severe kidney disease can actually, and diabetes can cause changes in the breath that just give the animals a strange odor. So those are a couple of things off the top of my head. So look into each of those things and see if that is the issue. Um, and also always talk to your local veterinarian. Smelly cat. <laughs> okay. All right. Good question. Hello, Essence Drake. Is it important to deworm a cat every month? Well, that depends, my friend. So for your standard indoor only cat, um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say no because that cat is likely not getting worms from anywhere, right? I still tend to deworm these cats every six months if I see them or at least once a year. I also do check uh, their poo to see if they have any eggs in them, right? So for those cats, I say no. I think it's overkill, honestly. And if you're worried, if you've been deworming your cat every month and you're worried, well, why don't you try, instead of deworming, taking a fecal sample to your vet and having it checked, right? That can give you some peace of mind. So if you have an outdoor cat or you have a cat that likes to hunt, uh, I would say it's more important to have those cats dewormed more frequently because when they're out, you don't know what they're doing. You don't know what they're eating. <laughs> and you don't know what they're bringing home to share with the rest of you guys, right? So I would say those cats are a better uh, candidate for continual deworming. And the reason being is because you just never know what they're getting exposed to. So hope that answers your question. Oh, I, so I, I'm going to throw this one up here, but I am, I probably can't answer it for you. So, uh, Rosie the pig, <laughs> you guys have the best names. After eight years together, your boys got in a fight, have been separated for over a year. Can't re reintroduce help. Oh, honey. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Um, I cannot. So I don't know what you've tried already for reintroduction. Um, if you came to me at the vet clinic, I would talk to you about all of the calming aids that I just talked about. Um, I would talk about using those and uh, I would utilize calming aids to make sure I would even utilize um, medication that's strong enough, like prescription strength, right? Because if these guys are going to be reintroduced, it has to be positive. So I would definitely utilize those calming aids and then I would, I would go real, real slow. Um, so first of all, make sure the cats aren't anxious, make sure they have space to get away from each other. I would start by keeping one in a bathroom or a bedroom or some place where they cannot be together. Um, and then I would allow, keep the door closed. And then I would allow them to uh, sniff each other under the door or just be aware of each other. And I would probably do that for a long time. Um, since it sounds like this is a longer standing problem with you, I would do it for a, a, at least 10 days, maybe a month. And I would continue to do it until there's no more growling or no more redirected aggression to other cats or no more problems with be behavioral problems, right? I would do it until those cats are okay. And then the next thing I would do is I would um, put some sort of screen between them, maybe a baby gate or, you know, just a screen door or something so that they can see each other and sniff each other, but can't get to eat each other. So any kind of barrier that you can use that keeps them from getting to each other. And then I would continue to utilize the calming aids the entire time. I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't in introduce any other kind of stress or cats into the house. Um, I would make sure that I'm in a calm space, right? Because they can pick up on our energy. Um, and then I would see how that goes. And I would do that 
for as long as it takes. Make sure each cat obviously has their own set of resources and places where they can get away that they don't have to see each other. And then see if that works. Um, and then if, you've, if you're a couple of months into this and you still don't see any aggression, maybe a supervised visit together. But if the aggression escalates again, these guys may just not be good cohabitators and that's okay. That's okay. We want what's best for the cats, right? So if it's best for a cat to not be in our house and to be someplace else and maybe be a single cat household, then that's what needs to happen. And that's okay. But see if those tips help. And then definitely um, consult with a feline behavioral specialist. You can do a lot with these people over the phone, over the Zoom now. Lots of ways to consult with these people. And again, not a feline behaviorist here, veterinarian. But if you were my client, that's what I would say. Okay? All right. Here is another question. Adrian. Hi, Adrian. Thank you for asking. And I love them. So what does it mean when cats suck on the corner of a blanket and need the rest? Is it a self-soothing thing? How very observant of you, my friend. I would say yes. So that is a likely a behavior that is left over from kittenhood where that kitten uh, was nursing mom. And when they nurse, they do this, right? Because it helps bring down the milk. And so when your cat is doing that, it is likely very self-soothing. It's boosting all kinds of feel good chemicals in, in the, um, in the, um, in the brain. And if it's not obsessive, like all the time, right. I would just let your cat do it, right. That your cat has found a way to help them feel happy and calm. And if it's not destroying your property or it's not obsessive or it's not causing any medical problems with the cat, let them do it. Okay. Oh goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently there are a couple things you just like never talk about on the internet, right? Religion, politics, COVID-19, <laughs> and pet food. <laughs> I'll have to tell you, if you Google me, there was like five, six, seven years. It's a long time. Five, six years ago, I wrote a, an article um, reviewing a documentary called Pet Fooled. And I wrote it as a, a way to help veterinarians talk to their clients about food. And um, that kind of got me blacklisted because you don't talk about nutrition on the internet because everyone has very distinct, different ideas about what the best thing is to feed these animals. And so many people, some people get so over identified with their opinion and they cherish it so much that you cannot have a different opinion than that. And if you do, they attack you, right? I don't know if you've ever run into that, but I have, it's not any fun. So I'm going to tell you what I generally say to people, because I too get overwhelmed with the number of choices out there. How do you pick what's the best? So um, what I say first is you need to make sure is you look on the bag, on the back of the bag, there should be a AFCO nutrition statement. And this is again in the States. All right. It's, there's probably a uh, same kind of thing in the EU. Not sure for the rest of the world should probably look that up, but at least in the States, there should be AFCO, A-A-F-C-O, American Association of Feed Control Officials. It's an advisory body. Um, much like the CDC is an advisory body, right? And what they do is they review this uh, food to make sure that it is complete and balanced for all life stages. And if it is, then they give it the go ahead and you can feed it and rest assured that all of your cat's nutritional needs will be met. There will be no deficiencies. It does not say anything about the quality of the ingredients, but it's just checking for overall formulation, okay? So make sure that it says it's a AFCO, A-A-F-C-O uh, certified for uh, complete and balanced nutrition for all life stages, uh, for, it could say for growth and lactation, that's for kittens and for queens, which queens are mother cats, uh, or it can, and that's about it. And it can either be done by feeding trial or it can be done by formulation. I don't care which. 
I really don't. A lot of vets say feeding trial only. I'm just happy you're feeding something that's complete and balanced, basically. The next thing you need to do is you need to make sure that there is meat, at least if you're doing a commercial kibble, uh, make sure that there's meat products that you recognize in at least the first three ingredients, because the first couple of ingredients on the ingredient panel are what the bulk of the food is made up of. And so you want to make sure that there's actual meat in there because cats are obligate carnivores and they require meat to be completely nutritionally balanced, all right? And then beyond that, it's very subjective what you want, right? Um, I like to feed food that is manufactured and sourced within the United States because there is more control over those ingredients. If you are buying a food that sources from someplace else, say China, you, there's different regulations over there. You're not quite sure what you're getting. Also, the thing that's important is to make sure that that food is well controlled from when it's manufactured to when it hits your cat's food bowl. A lot of people don't ever think about where that food has been before it hits your house, right? Before it goes in your shopping cart. And what I tell you is that the food is made somewhere at a manufacturing plant. And then oftentimes it is shipped to a distribution center. And then from the distribution center, it goes out to the different grocery stores, or maybe it's shipped straight to your home, or it goes to a brick and mortar um, uh, pet food store, right? Where is the food in all of that, right? I've seen food that is sitting outside uh, on a flatbed truck and having rats running over it in 110 degree weather. <laughs> That's not ideal, right? That is not ideal. So I like food that comes directly from the manufacturer. One of my favorites, I am gonna put one out there. One of my favorites is Life's Abundance Foods. Very small, uh, very highly controlled. They control their product very well and they ship directly to the consumer. Uh, you want a website, www wellpetnet.com is a place you can go to look at their products. What I like is I know the formulator, um, Jane Bix. She's great. They, I love that they source everything um, as high as possible. They are tightly controlled on their manufacturing. And I love their canned food uh, because it is just meat and water and some grass. That's about it. I like that. I like simplicity. So the next thing I want to tell you is some people have difficulties choosing a food that has like corn or wheat or something in it. So there are a lot of options for you if you don't want those in your food. And that's okay if you do. And that's okay if you don't. If you are thinking about feeding raw, great, right? I wouldn't do it if your cat has any kind of immunosuppression, right? Their immune system isn't up to snuff, or if your immune system isn't up to snuff, right? Because raw food um, is going to be higher, you're going to be have a higher likelihood of certain bacterial um, contamination, right? And make sure you're getting those, those ingredients from a reputable source. Also, if you are feeding raw, I recommend working with a veterinary nutritionist to have a recipe formulated out from you. I don't often see uh, cats that are malnutritioned from eating raw because their owners are very, very um, intuitive and very involved in their cat's food, but it can happen. And one of the main deficiencies that we, we as vets are worried about is taurine, taurine deficiency. Um, so that is an essential amino acid that cats must eat. And so it has to come from their food. So I feel like I've said a lot on this and I'm probably not going to say any more. Um, so hopefully that gives you some place to start. Miss Madeline, thank you very much for your question. Okay. Tips on dental health care for cats, things we should do. So yeah, uh, cats can get dental disease just like dogs do. Um, they can, so one of the best ways to deal with it is to, uh, there are dental chews available. Um, dental chews, I would say get dental chews that are actually um, veterinarian recommended. Uh, one of the big products out there, CET, 
they have, uh, it's by Verbac, I'm pretty sure, CET Choose. Those are the ones I used to uh, give to my clients all the time when I was in practice. They're little, they're like this big, that big. And then you can cut them in half, like I could cut them in half so they last longer. Um, but basically that chewing, the, the way the fibers are aligned inside of the product is supposed to shear off plaque and tartar. So dental chews are something that you can use. Um, I always recommend brushing. People la like they literally laugh at me when I they're like brush a cat's teeth. Yes, it can be done and cats can actually be trained to do it and they can be trained to enjoy it. Um, and they can't, most brushes are too big to fit in their, in their mouths. So a lot of people will just take a dental wipe and they'll wrap it around their finger and then they just wipe it on the outside of the teeth like that. I don't recommend obviously going in because you're going to be at risk for a bite, but the dental wipes wrapped around your finger, I find is a pretty good way. Uh, if you do that several times a week to cut down on the uh, plaque and bacteria, there is also dental diets. Um, TD is the one that I'm thinking of. I know there are all other dental diets um, that are supposed to reduce plaque and tartar. Okay. And then have your cat's check, teeth checked at least once a year. If you can afford to have their teeth cleaned uh, once a year, I generally don't recommend it any younger than age three because I feel like it's unnecessary in most cats. But if you can have them in and have their teeth cleaned once a year, then they're less likely to have any kind of big problems because you're catching things early. Also, the expense goes way down because to just clean a mouth is a lot quicker than cleaning a mouth and then taking out a bunch of teeth. So having the teeth cleaned professionally by a veterinarian, not a groomer, once a year is a excellent thing. And when you take your pet to the groomer and have them brush the teeth, that's great, but it's not going to remove any tartar. It's like when you brush your teeth, right? And then you still go to the dentist and they still take all that tartar off. That's because you can't get it with a brush once it's turned into tartar. So I recommend cleaning by a veterinarian. Also, I don't think that they do any anesthesia-free dentals in cats. Can't even imagine how you would do that. I know they've done them in dogs. I don't recommend them because you can only clean this part of the tooth. And there is so much that happens under the gums and you can't even get to that at all under an anesthesia free dental. Furthermore, it kind of hurts to have your teeth clean. I don't know if you've had your teeth cleaned. It doesn't feel good. You know what's going on. An animal doesn't know what's going on. And I, I do not recommend those at all. That's just me. Feel free to leave comments about that. We can talk about it as much. Oh, Wow, this is a hard question. What should we do now that a majority of veterinarians are not accepting new patients? Yeah, it's not okay, right? You guys all adopted pets during the quarantine two years or whenever that was ago, and now you need help, right? That So I do believe that this is a, a big problem. Um, I would say writing to your uh, local uh, state veterinary medical association, if you're in the States, and telling them that you're having issues about a not being able to find a veterinarian, right to the AVMA, right? Because these are advisory bodies that are designed to advise vets, but we need to know what you guys need and what where we are falling short. And so I would start squeaking, right? The squeaky wheel always gets the grease. But I agree, guys, there is a significant shortage right now. I don't have an answer to this. Another um, option could be telemedicine, right? So telemedicine is where you set up an appointment with a veterinarian over the internet and you have like a Zoom call and they can treat you that way. And a lot of times, a lot of things can be treated with telemedicine. Um, and the nice thing is if you get your foot in the door with a telemedicine and they can't handle it, they often have somebody that they're referring to. So you may have to go that route to start. But I agree. I, it's, it's, it is a shame. And I am sorry because I feel like as a professional a little bit, we're failing <laughs> you guys. So start squeaking. Tell them this is not okay. In the past, there's been initiatives before to um, 
develop a position that's like a nurse practitioner, but for veterinarians. Um, I'm not sure where that initiative is now, but I feel personally, I feel the need for it. And you guys are definitely feeling the need for that. So good luck, my friend. My gosh, 10 minutes left. This goes so fast. This goes so fast. I have 10 minutes left. Okay. <laughs> Let me look through these questions and see. Oh, this is a very mindful question. I really appreciate it. So this person, Vina, I have two cats. One recently went to the ER. We are now going through non-recognition aggression. Do you recommend I take the cat that was at home back to the ER vet to smell the ER scents? I would recommend doing what I had said a little bit earlier about the reintroduction. You may need to reintroduce them as if they are two new cats. So your cat that just went to the ER has been through a massive trauma, okay? And trauma, as we all know, can cause us and our pets to behave very poorly. So if you are having a non-redirected, non-recognition aggression, which is what happens when a cat fails to recognize their, their mate and then is aggressive, it could also be redirected aggression. Your cat could have been so stressed by the event that now it's just acting out and projecting, right? So in order to avoid any injuries, I would do what I recommended to the person I talked about, I talked about it about 20 minutes ago, where you go back to reintroducing them slowly. And that means separating, right? They, they need some space. They need a time out, right? And the more you push it, the higher likelihood they are going to fight. So you need to let them reintroduce themselves on their own terms very slowly between like rewind this about 20 minutes because I go on and on about this, right? And then also talk to your vet about the calming aids that I talked about, getting some calming aids on board um, for the one that is aggressive, even if it's something like gabapentin, which is a very safe muscle relaxant that just makes cats happy, right? Talk to them about getting something like that. I don't recommend taking the other cat to the ER um, because then you may have two traumatized cats, okay? So do that and then check back with me, okay? And again, this is for medical purposes or educational purposes only, right? Educational, not intended to replace your local veterinarian's uh, advice on any level. Okay. I already had this question once, but I'm going to answer it one more time really quick. Um, when should I be worried about persistent deciduous teeth? So remember one of our first questions was, uh, my cat is nine months old or 11 months old and still has baby teeth. Should I be worried? Baby teeth are also called deciduous teeth because they fall out like leaves, deciduous trees lose their leaves, right? Deciduous teeth fall off. So you need to be concerned uh, when they uh, reach about 12 to 15 months of age. If they still have those teeth, they are likely never going to come out and you need to have them removed. There you go. Do, 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 do. Okay. Two questions from Star Child. Hello, Star Child. Uh, I, must I need to use an enzymatic toothpaste for my cat? Uh, well, you must not do anything. You choose to do everything. But if you would choose to provide your cat with excellent level dental care, then I would recommend an enzymatic toothpaste because they cut down plaque and bacteria much more quickly, right? It's a much more effective way to clean your cat's teeth at home versus just a dry toothbrush. If you don't want to use that, then you can do, um, like I had said, the dental wipes instead. Those usually come with some sort of enzymatic cleanser impregnated in them, or they can have chlorhexidine in them, which is a disinfectant. Okay. Should my cat have a companion cat or are they fine on their own? Uh, well, that depends. So just like people, cats uh, have a different levels of introversion and extroversion. Some of them are ambiverts, so they have both. If your cat is an introvert and loves being alone, don't get another cat. Generally speaking, when people ask me this, I tell them that cats are interesting characters because they form little social pods uh, that are pretty unbreakable. 
And that social pod that they're in may only consist of themselves. And if you try to put another cat into this little social world that your cat has created, that can lead to a lot of upset. Sometimes it works out. A lot of times it just causes more stress. So instead of getting a companion cat, I would recommend just playing with your cat more, right? Just engage your cat more and enjoy your cat. You don't need another cat necessarily. But that's just my opinion, right? Okay. Da, 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 da. Okay. Good question. You guys are beautiful questions. What causes blood in stools? Sometimes I notice little traces of fresh red blood on her stools, but she's never sick. Her weight is normal, nor does she have diarrhea. Could it be hemorrhoids? Great question. Great question. So when you see blood on the stool, like you're describing, that is some sort of, uh, that's a problem. That is a some sort of problem near the very end of the gastrointestinal tract. So the end is the anus, right? Comes out there, but right before there you have the rectum and then the colon. And if there's something going on there right near the edge, you're gonna get little traces of fresh blood on the surface of the stool. So that can be anything. Do they get hemorrhoids? I've never seen a cat with hemorrhoids, but I have seen cats with prolapsed rectums, which looks like a hemorrhoid. So part of the anal tissue actually comes out. It's really gross. I know. I've seen cats with anal gland issues. So they have two little scent glands located at the four and seven o'clock position of their little tushy. And sometimes that can cause them to have blood in their stool. Uh, Parasites. Parasites are a big cause, right? So uh, is it a life-threatening condition? Probably not. Is there something going on that needs to be addressed? Yeah, but it's probably something that's not very serious. So what I would say is it's important, first of all, make sure your cat is free of parasites. The easiest way to do that is just collect a fresh stool sample from your cat's litter box, Take it on down to your vet and say, hey, can you please check this for parasites for me? Generally runs anywhere from 40 to 50 bucks, 30 bucks, depends on where you're at. Um, if you have a working relationship with them already, they should do that for you, right? And make sure there's no parasites. If there's no parasites, uh, when they call you to tell you about the results, say, well, I just have some concerns because I'm seeing what, and describe exactly what you just said to me. And then they'll give you their opinion as well. And they may say that they want to see your cat. Okay. So if, if you are concerned about your cat's health and well-being, which it sounds like you are because you're here. Hello. Um, you might as well just make sure that this little issue is resolved. It's probably not a big deal on any level, but it's not normal. And we don't want, we don't want it at all. Okay. All right. Two minutes left. Okay. I, I'm like looking for the perfect question to close this out on. Oh my gosh. Okay. We're going to go with this one. All right. Here you go. My cat is seven months old. How much should I be feeding? Should I feed dry or wet food? So at seven months of age, your cat is almost fully grown. So at seven months of age, you can start thinking about switching from a kitten food to an adult food. And how much should you be feeding your cat? Well, cats at that age tend to be pretty good self-regulators. So I would look on the bag and see what it says for your cat's weight. So on the back of the bag, there should be a weight chart that says, if your cat weighs this much, feed this much, all right? So most cats around that age are generally thin and in good condition still. So I would look at that on the back of the bag as you're starting and then, no joke guys, Pet food companies want to sell food, right? So I feel like they always, they always say feed a little bit more than they should, right? So I always feed a little bit under that. I always feed a little bit under that. Um, and then I like a combination of canned and dry. If you are feeding commercial foods, 
which if you are, no judgment, okay, no big deal. I would feed both canned and dry and I would combine all the calories for the day to be no more than 350 K cows for the day for most cats. I'm talking about cats in the seven to 10 pound range. So on your bag, it should say that that food is equal to K cows per cup. And it usually will say 300, 350, 400, what, whatever, right? So you're going to need to take 350 and divide it by however many K cows per cup they say on the bag. And then it's usually, it's maybe it's one cup, maybe it's three quarters of a cup, whatever it is. Okay. And then I feed a little bit under that. And I include both the canned and the dry in the daily total amount, right? So you can't just feed 350 calories of kibble and then add it another 50 calories of canned because then you're going to have a fat cat. You don't want a fat cat. They're fat cats, they cost a lot and they don't live as long. No. Um, so yeah, that's how I would do that. Um, and then I would also, if you're feeling super nerdy about it, I would get a gram scale and I would weigh the food out because Dr. Ernie Ward, who is a big proponent of healthy weights for pets, he says that even feeding like one or two kibble more than you should over a long period of time leads to gradual weight gain. And that gradual weight gain is harder to get off. So make sure you're feeding the accurate amount. If you don't know if your cat's too heavy, there's a simple way to find out, okay? So it's a hand test. I've taught this a hundred times, but I'm gonna keep teaching it because it's perfect. So you wanna feel your cat's ribs. They are right behind the back, the front legs. So right behind the point of the elbow, you know, where your cat is standing, the elbow, you feel those ribs right there. Feel them. If they feel like the back of your hand, perfect. Cat is a perfect weight. If it feels like the front of your hand, too heavy. If it feels like your knuckles or it's sticking out like your knuckles, oh my God, I'm so terrible at this. Too skinny, feed more. Okay. Those are general, general guidelines, but they should get you through a lot. All right. All right, my friends, I am totally out of time. Once again, I have so appreciated spending this time with you. I I feel like your questions are insightful and beautiful and show that you truly care about these cats that are sharing your lives. And I am extraordinarily grateful to have this time with you. So if you have more questions or you would like to know more, there is a phenomenal forum available at the All About Cats website. The It's right there. You can see it on the screen. But you can go there and you can post your questions. You can read answers. You can get support, right? I hang out there, um, other vets hang out there, and it's a great place to go if your question didn't get answered today. All right, so come visit me there. Also, I will be back next month. I tend to come in the last Tuesday of every month. So if you didn't get your question answered this time, come back next month. Um, what I found is the earlier you jump on and get your question in the queue, the higher likelihood I can get to it because because you guys have so many beautiful questions. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Wooten. I appreciate each and every one of you. Please have a beautiful day. Please stay safe. And I will see you again next month. Bye.